Hello, welcome uh, all of you who are with us today, this evening or this afternoon, depending on where you are. We are here today to present the four phase report Mediterranean Trend 2030-2050, a prospective approach to the southern neighborhood, coordinated by Alfonso Pesani and myself. Alfonso is a professor at Universidad Complutense de Madrid and is also going to be a speaker today. Hello, Alfonso. We also have with us two amazing researchers and friends, Yusuf Sharif, director at Columbia, Centers for uh, Columbia Global Center Tunis, sorry, and Amra Ali, fellow at the Forum for Transregional Studies in Berlin. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. <laughs> sorry, sorry, that's the case. I am in so good company. This is such a pleasure. I will try to present the report very briefly so that we can devote most of our time to listen to the experts and eventually to, to questions from the audience. So on the occasion of the 25th anniversary of the Barcelona process and the 10th anniversary of the Arab uprising, we imagined and carried out an exercise that will not just look backward, but above all, will force all of us to look forward with the information we have nowadays at our disposal. In the document, we thus identify six mega trends with an eye to 2050 and nine dynamics in the medium term looking to 2030. All of these trends define the evolution and range of possible directions in which southern neighborhood countries and societies are heading towards. In a global and complex reality like the current one, you can just imagine the level of interconnections between these phenomena. You can see an infographic here, I think we are going to share the image, with some of these intertwining. The report is full of very cool graphs so as to deeper understand the accompanying analysis. In terms of mega trends, obviously, I don't know if you see that. I don't, <laughs> I know them by heart, so that's, that's cool. So we have climate emergency and its translation in terms of vulnerability in the southern neighborhood, energy and water security and the multiplier effects of conflict and mobility stand out. We also have decarbonization that comes into play, new opportunities, yes, but also a deepening of the north-south divide, particularly in regard to the middle not left behind. We have the fragmentation of the international order. We have the demographic transition, of course. So even though most focus their interest on the so-called youth vault, these societies, especially in the Maghreb, age and create new necessities and demands. We have human mobility, but also urbanization. And we have the so-called post-industrial revolution. We turn to the dynamics with our sites set on 2030, first and obviously the existing factors within the populations of the southern neighborhoods, socio-political, socio-economic, intergenerational in terms of gender, that create a schism between on the one hand societies and on the other the regime and the elite, both the political and the economic elite. These factors are closely connected to the erosion of the post-colonial Arab state system, and Amro and Joseph have just published a book on that that is really interesting. In 2010, 2011, and afterwards, societies wonder whether there was a state that was looking out for them at all. States do not invest in good governance, but increasingly do so in repression and authoritarianism. In the context of a counter-revolutionary wave, you have all witness. One of the most worrisome factors is the one regarding the youth, expelled from the system from an economic and political point of view. Let's not forget, additionally, the negative impact of the digital divide, which affects the most vulnerable, particularly women, and threatens to leave millions behind. Millions of workers, for, of course, but also of citizens, subjected to even higher levels of surveillance and repression. Another factor to take into account is the territorial one, both with regard to the central periphery dynamics and also with regard to the cities where possibilities of exclusion multiply. Also, we are speaking about the evolution of the energy market, although the energy transition is still in the early stages. Many of the neighborhood countries, particularly as a consequence of COVID-19, have accumulated considerable levels of debt, both public and private, and their strategic status has allowed them to do so until now. But we also wonder whether some countries, for example, Egypt is not too big to fail, but too big to save. Then we have the militarization of the region and the increase in structural violence that has translated into bigger potential for conflict. And last but not least, we have securitization that is not exclusively a trend when it comes to the European Union or the global north. There has been growing securitization of migratory flows and flows of goods also in the neighborhood itself. 
we have spoken with many, many experts who have thought of this nor enormously. Without them, the documents would not have been possible. Some of them agreed to write short analyses in which they share their expertise and vision for the future. A real honor. We have both of them today. This is Joseph and Amro, Amro and Joseph, who will hopefully accept to answer some of my questions. I am certain it's going to be an instructor and dynamic because it's going to last just one hour conversation. <laughs> So first of all, I would like Alfonso to address one of the mega trends present in many forms when it comes to both the medium and the long term. That is, of course, the climate emergency and the interrelated scarcity of resources. Alfonso, the floor is yours. Uh, yes, thank you, Chasso. Uh, very quickly, thank you, Pascual, for the for the invitation. I'm very happy to be presenting here the translation of the of the foresight report that we that we did. Well, as, as you can see, and I, as, as all of you can see in the infographics that it also was, was showing, uh, we decided to take um, to place uh, the, the climate emergency uh, the first as the first mega trend because of the importance that it has. We wanted to highlight the relevance that it that it has, the the global impact that it's going to have, that it's going to affect all of the different countries that we were analyzing, but of course all of the, the different countries of the of the planet as well. And the way that it's going to affect the, the economic uh, and social development of the region and in that sense of the political development of the region. Uh, so I think that we have an, an infographic as well that I, I wanted to show you here. Um, I wanted to show it to you because I'm not going to enter too much into the different numbers that we've gathered. So I, I will focus more on the on this socio-political dimension. But you can see uh, uh, some part of the of the impact on the, yeah. on the interference that we are that we're seeing so the end climate change is an increasing phenomenon it, phenomenon it's something that we've been seeing for the last decade is something that it's more than expected uh, to, to increase exponentially over time in the in the following decades up to the point that it's actually going to to put the planet's sustainability as, as a whole at risk and I, it was important, uh, not, not only for this, but because it's, uh, it's effect, it's especially noticeable in the, in the Mediterranean basin. So in that sense, as, as you can see, it's going to uh, imply uh, well, an increase in temperatures and in, 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 in precipitations in the that sea levels, uh, the precipitation, water stress. And at the end, it's going to create much, much distress. And in that sense, we're focused especially on the food and what we think that that's going to that that's going to cause it links with this idea of the of the scarcity of resources in the region and we wanted to highlight in that sense that the, this scarcity of resources in the region is it's not just a, a consequence of, of climate change and its impact but also a, con a consequence of many different uh, many other dimensions such as uh, poor governmental uh, governmental management or the mismanagement of, of climate change as well we could say uh, the intensive economic models that we are that we're actually applying, or, or the different trends that we that we've also highlighted, uh, such as the strong population growth, the urbanization trends, the agricultural development that we're experiencing, and in that sense we're going to see like this sort of catch twenty two, we could say, in which all of these trends are actually contributing to the increase of climate change, but at the same time uh, will be very negatively affected by by them. I, let's take, for instance, uh, uh, to, to, to try and, and, and showcase some of some of the impacts that we can see. I was thinking, for example, the rising sea levels and the way the, the distress or the stress that they're going to place on 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 the cities on in the in the coasts of the of the region. Say, for instance, uh, Egypt. The, the social tensions that it's going to create, the human mobilization that it's going to create, the impact that it's going to have on on, on the different urban uh, urban locations, and the way it might lead to to these so-called bread revolts or these uh, revolts for the scarcity of resources. And it's interesting because it's not only going to be noticeable from a, a from a national perspective, but also for, from an international perspective as well, in the sense that many most of these resources are actually shared uh, between one between the different countries of the region, which means that that they, as as uh, these resources become more scarce, uh, tensions will increase. The competition for for the the, uh, the the domination or the use or and the 
of these uh, resources will increase. I think that, uh, for example, the, the tensions between Ethiopia and, and Egypt uh, for the for the Blue Nile Dam is a very good example. A very good example that is it's happening today. And and well, I, I would highlight without wanting to take too much time uh, as as well the way that uh, this. This climate change is going to affect the population in very different ways. In the world, for example, uh, talking about uh, these this, uh, people living in the coasts and these people living in the inner in the inner countries, we could talk about the rural population and the urban population. And I think we should talk as well about the people with more uh, economic uh, commodities and the people in in, in higher uh, economic uh, vulnerable situations or in worse. Economic situations, which means that at the end, uh, this uh, this climate change is going to affect one of the problems that the region has as well, which is the the, in, the uh, inequality, economic gaps. It's going to contribute. It's going to. It's also going to increase it, and in that sense, it's going to increase uh, this sort of conflictivity, this sort of of tensions. So I think I, I could end with two with two notes, sort of two notes, uh, opportunities or recommendations. The first one would need would be the need for cooperation at a macro level. We could say we're at a point right now uh, uh, because of the of this uh, the health crisis that we're living or this sort of post COVID world that offers a, a possibility for a, for a more more sustainable uh, economic model. And there are very good uh, local uh, uh, local initiatives, but we are actually we actually need to think uh, at a macro level, uh, at a macro level and a global level in the sense of cooperation between different states, and that's something that everyone needs to to acknowledge. The second one I wanted to highlight it because we've also highlighted it in the report as our second mega trend. It's the process of decarbonization, part of the solution for climate change. But part of the solution, and in spite of us uh, highlighting it as a, as a mega trend, part of a solution that's going to come in, in very different speeds, that's going to have some sort of winning and losing countries depending on the uh, the resource that they they have, their availability, their the the mobility that they have for a, for an easier or harder energy transformation, and the ability or the dependence that they have of more uh, polluting energies. Uh, Taking everything into account, still it's it's part of the solution. It's part that, that we need to take into account, and that that's actually going to happen. And we're witnessing how it how it happens. I think this gives more or less a very brief, but I, I hope that the good idea of of the climate change situation in the region. Thanks so much, Alfonso. So yeah, that, that's that's one of the things that the report highlights how most of this dynamic both when it comes to the long term and the medium term is going to leave behind winners and losers and especially it's going to 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 to, to have as an outcome an increase in, in terms of inequality and, and the most vulnerable are they going to be the most affected when it comes to climate change when it comes to scarcity of resources but when it comes to to the digital divide and when it comes to conflict as well it's, it's always the case and this is something this is a, something we wanted to highlight. So Yusuf and Amro, could you speak about uh, about your, your respective contributions to the document, so both incredibly special and insightful, but from different points of view. So Amro first, because it's also linked to, to Alfonso's presentation, the title of your, of your piece, of your text is Alexandria, Climate Change and the Mediterranean Narrative. So could you expand a bit on that, please? Okay, thank you, Richard. And thank you for the foundation for the invitation to write for an important project, as well as the event that you're doing tonight. Okay, so how does one start on this uh, very uh, crucial event? I, I'll, I'll start off with saying this, that uh, when you do a Google search of Alexandria, the most common Google search is, does Alexandria exist? Okay, <laughs> so uh, I, I don't know if that's because of, uh, you know, they've heard of it in some sort of myth or if it's because of the game Assassin's Creed. Uh, and so they are trying to understand if Alexander exists. But I, I kind of find this to be a, a bad omen. You know, like it's, it's like Google is, uh, you know, archiving searches from the future. <laughs> and, um, and so uh, there is a high risk that Alexandria is, um, is at risk of being submerged um, by the year 2050. Um, and that might be being generous as well. So large parts of it will go underwater. 
So, uh, you know, there's a, there's a debate about doing an underwater museum in Alexandria at the moment. So I think I want to tell them you don't need to do that because all of Alexandria will become an underwater museum at this rate. Uh, so Alexandria has, uh, as you know, like it has many identities. It's celebrated for its historical cosmopolitanism, uh, you know, looking at Greeks, Italians, Arabs, Egyptians, uh, Jews, Armenians. Uh, and I think of all the identities that are, is now critical to focus on is the Mediterranean identity, because it's the one identity that's now an existential identity. And it's an existential question because it is linked to the survival of the city. Uh, the one way to do this is to address Alexandria's uh, propensity to look to the past, to the, its nostalgic DNA that it lives by and shift it to the future. And it's really crucial to do that because the, the sea is really integral to the identity and to the worldview of the residents of Alexandria. In fact, there's an expression in Alexandria that says, um, if I leave Alexandria, I will feel like a fish out of water. Uh, this is a common expression and it, and it uh, means uh, a lot to people who, um, who grew up knowing only the sea uh, as a, as a very fundamental aspect of their sense of being. Uh, the problem at the moment, or it's actually been happening for a while, is the privatization and the development drive of Alexandria that hides the sea from the people. Uh, and this is actually skewing um, the, you know, the, not just the conversation, but uh, shifting us away from very, very key problems uh, re relating to the city where there needs to be a higher focus on uh, climate change, given that Alexandria is one of five cities in the world that is, uh, that is at high risk of, um, of, of being submerged underwater. So one of the uh, approaches uh, made in the paper and that I think is very important is to rehabilitate Alexandria into a regional narrative. Uh, now that has been done before, uh, but from an elite level since the 1990s, with you know, the Swedish Institute um, and all the French Institute and, and many different uh, governmental bodies and international organizations that do that, uh, but it hasn't really uh, co-opted the public in a, in, a, in a wider sense to make every resident feel like they have some sort of invested future in Alexandria, whether it's just, you know, even if it means not throwing rubbish uh, in the sea, but at, at, a, at, a, at a very basic level right up to uh, reconsideration of investment decisions. So the idea of investment has to be tailored towards uh, protecting the shores and minimizing the, the, the coming deluge. So uh, I think when Alexandria sees itself in a bigger project, a bigger picture, uh, as part of a, a bigger narrative, a Mediterranean story linked to Barcelona and Beirut and Naples and Tunis and so forth, then it feels like, okay, this is critical. I'm the one being most affected here and I've got to cooperate with all these cities to try and um, address a crisis that's long you know, started. And it's not about stopping it, it's about minimizing it. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, I love this idea of the invested future, which also hinges on, on, on investment decisions. And, and uh, yeah, this idea of turning, uh, of depending not just on, on, on top down decisions, but bottom up, and also the report uh, put an emphasis on that, or how the citizens have to be involved, but also have to have a say, not to, be, not to just be involved. So you said your, your piece is, your text is called Tunisia's Long Road to 2030. Uh, a, a bit of this a little bit Peruvian. I don't know if that's conversation in English, but <laughs> you're, you've been the, the master of foresighting when it comes to that. So could, uh, would you care to elaborate a bit on that, please? Thank you, and hi, everyone. I mean, I don't think I was that clairvoyant, frankly. Uh, on the contrary, I mean, the yes, that some parts, uh, because we, we have to remind um, the audience that, uh, that this was written um, sometime in the spring, late spring, early this summer. Um, and then in Tunisia, as you know, on July 25th, we have, since July 25th, we have a completely new uh, political setting in, in the country and things are evolving very, very quickly. Um, now that I'm talking to you, we just received the news that um, the uh, diplomatic passport of the former president uh, Monsef Marzouti was withdrawn. So things are very actually, 
changing very quickly in, in the country. And therefore, what I said about um, how democracy uh, kind of uh, correct itself by itself or how democracy is um, moving forward, um, it's unclear whether that's something that is moving forward or not. Um, but you're right. I mean, some of the things that were said in the in the in this paper about uh, the road between uh, 2021 and 2030 are uh, proved more or less accurate. Um, not least the fact that it will be and it is a very uh, shaky road. Um, so I think, uh, of course. Uh, one of the main issues that uh, the country will have to cope with between now and uh, 2030 um, is the side effect of COVID-19. Uh, not necessarily the health part of it, um, that's now being uh, addressed, solved with the vaccines, with the um, global uh, decline in COVID cases. So Tunisia today looks um, almost out of the tunnel. Um, one can say, and the uh, vaccines are available, but the, the, the situation looks more or less um, under control. But the economic situation uh, that uh, was already very bad before 2020, that um, went to unprecedented levels uh, because of the COVID crisis, that economic situation is now um, very hard to, to solve and very hard to uh, cope with. So that's the one thing, the economic situation is the one thing that um, Tunisia has to cope with and that can go either way. I mean, that, well, I mean, different ways. That can stay like this and therefore we can have this ongoing um, economic crisis that, um, you know, it's a status quo, but it's a negative status quo. Um, and and things can uh, and and people will live or survive like this, um, but it can also go uh, the very wrong direction, which is towards um, maybe an even more harsh economic situation. Um, we always know and see what happens, uh, what happened, and what is happening in Lebanon. Uh, so perhaps not now, but in a few years from now, uh, that's a possibility to see something like that happening um, in Tunisia. I mean, it, it happened in much richer countries. I mean, we also know what happened in Venezuela, for instance. So that's that's also a possibility. Um, and, and that would lead to uh, more social instability and so on and so on. Um, there are slight prospects for um, an improvement of the economic situation uh, which are related to first of all the global um, economic uh, recovery if there is a global recovery um, which will lead to uh, more tourists in the country uh, but also more investments locally and abroad and um, also more remittances from uh, Tunisians living abroad. Um, so that's a possibility, but I think that's, um, I would opt more for the uh, status quo rather than the, uh, rather than the, these two, um, uh, these two possibilities. Um, and um, along with it, there is the, uh, I mean, that's what, um, what I was trying to, to mention in this uh, article, the issue of the political system in Tunisia uh, that is facing, uh, that was facing before July 20, is facing today uh, really structural problems, um, mostly the fact that political parties barely exist in the country. Um, the parliament uh, is now semi-suspended, but the parliament already had issues of legitimacy. Not so many people uh, trusted the parliament and parliamentarians and um, are, according to the polls, a majority of Tunisians see that the parliament is useless and for a democracy, this is um, quite catastrophic. So the, these structural problems of political parties in Tunisia and of democratic institutions in Tunisia mean that um, between now and 2030, democracy, or at least the institution 
the institutions of democracy will have difficulties to uh, to work, to settle, um, and to take the country forward. Um, that's affecting the work of bureaucracy, even though institutions, um, I mean, by institutions, I mean, uh, I mean, public uh, health, public education, uh, public electricity, and all these um, things that make people live uh, daily life um, are working, even though there are a lot of big uh, political problems, um, but they work at their minimal level. Uh, we don't see a lot of innovation, we don't see a lot of reforms. Um, and then this leads me again to my earlier point, uh, thinking that there will be some kind of uh, status quo uh, with regards to the, um, to the institutions, um, to the bureaucratic institutions. Now, um, what is, or what, what is a little bit positive between now and 2030 uh, is that in the last 10 years at least, there is a um, whole generation that grew up under democracy, that came to age under democracy. And uh, this generation is now, I mean, after 10, living 10 years in democracy, and especially the younger ones uh, who, who actually represent the majority or at least um, population, um, who came to age under democracy uh, are, will be quite hard to, to tame if we have any authoritarian uh, regime in the upcoming, um, I mean, now or in the upcoming months. Um, and this, this um, EU, young population uh, will probably be uh, there in the street um, if its rights are uh, being oppressed and um, they are more or less um, the hope of democracy in this country. Um, once they, um, once they, uh, I mean, once they're able to uh, have their say in politics and have their say uh, and have their message reached to the, um, to the leaders uh, in the country, um, that uh, maybe, maybe then we will see um, some kind of um, changes in, um, in, in bureaucracy, because then there will be, some of them will, um, will be in politics, some of them will be in, um, um, in the bureaucratic uh, administrations. Uh, so with this new generation, um, there might be some change and we might see some change by the end of the decade or uh, early 2030s. Um, so I think this is more or less what I tried to say in this um, article and we can discuss other points in the, later. Thanks so much. So you paved you the way for the next question, but that's so cool. Uh, so the first medium term dynamic the report focuses on, and in my, in my opinion, that's that is the most important one, is the manifold fractures that lead to mobilization. And they also lead to other phenomena, but we focus on mobilization. And after almost a year commemorating, celebrating, or uh, well, I don't know, whatever you want, whatever word, verb you want to, to pick, the Arab uprising, what is your view on how protests and activism have evolved across the region or in, in specific countries? I am confident that the three of you have invaluable insights on the matter. So short answers, if you wish. We can start by, by Yusef so that he can complete his previous point and afterwards we do Amro and Alfonso. Well, I think um, with regards to social mobiliza mobilization, it's ongoing. Uh, it's not something that started in 2011, but it's something that uh, got accelerated, uh, that accelerated in 2011. Uh, since 2011, in a place like Tunisia with democracy, I think most people got used to the fact of going out in the street and demonstration uh, demonstrating. Um, but in other, in other places, even though they are, um, I mean, the political setting is less democratic, take Algeria, take Morocco, um, people are also out in the street um, and a lot of young people are in the street. Um, this is, there are many explanations, but um, 
um, uh, the fact that social media are available to almost everyone helped um, people to uh, connect with each other and go out in the street um, in, in a more uh, in a more uh, in a more ordered manner, maybe. And uh, I think we see this ongoing um, with and with the economic problems that all these countries are going through, um, and with the the, the, um, uh, the youth bulge that we see in all these countries, um, we will see more and more of these youth um, actually um, going in the street, mobilizing. Uh, so the big question is, how will the states of the region react? Will it be like before, so just repressing and uh, sending thousands of youth in um, to jail, um, or by finding a way to um, to negotiate with with their youth? Um, and I, I hope it's the second, um, it's the second alternative. Um, but in any case, even if it's the first alternative, I don't think it's that sustainable um, because jails are not enough for, for everyone. And, um, and we have more and more young people and the, those who are in power um, in, in some of, the, of these countries, some of those who are in power are actually people who are in their 60s and 70s. So these are not the younger, uh, dictators who are in their uh, 30s and region, those who are uh, imposing authoritarian uh, rules are um, people from the older generation, and the younger generation is not yet in the um, um, in the in the bureaucratic system. So, I don't think it's a sustainable way to continue this repression. Uh, so, they will be obliged. There will be. Uh, negotiations between um, the establishments, whatever they are, and uh, the younger um, populations and the younger groups that are demonstrating and, and uh, mobilizing in the streets. Thanks so much. I just want to stress this word sustainable, whether this is the current uh, status quo, and I think the word status quo is also key in order to understand what's happening and what our report speaks about. This is one of the scenarios, status quo, whether that's worse or best that uh, up for grabs and up for, up for debate, but sustainable. I, I think we all, the, the four of us believe that the current concepts are not sustainable and there are people willing to take to the streets, even if it's, uh, even if they know that they know they are confronted to maybe being killed or even going to jail, as I say, you, you mentioned the cases of Morocco, Algeria and Tunisia, but we've seen that in Egypt in 2019, when people took to the streets and it was mainly for economic reasons, but it was mainly because of economic desperation and fully knowing fully what was the, the, the strength of the repression and what might be the, the, the reaction of the regime, right? So, Andrew, okay, could you also expand uh, on or uh, contribute contribute with your opinion to, to, to this evolution, or if at all? Thank you, thank you, Chachu. And uh, yes, I would have to agree with Yusuf that this is uh, obviously a meta phenomenon that started long ago, before 2011. Uh, I would also like to say that uh, there was one marking point between before and uh, after 2011, in the sense that before 2011, the, the Arab state had a, a take it for granted authoritarianism that people just, you know, that of course there were protests and all that, but because there were no alternative visions and alternative political models that, you know, there was a sort of a tacit acceptance that the, that dictatorship is the way to go, that, you know, you, you know there's, a, there's a social contract that you, you know, we will surrender progressive governance and freedom in order to have subsidies and medical insurance and uh, free schooling and all that. Um, but of course, we entered the, the era of unsocial contracts. And, and you can read that in the book um, of, of uses, <laughs> the modern Arab states, which, which where it's discussed um, much more thoroughly. So the idea is that there's been a break. The situation is catastrophic across the region. We cannot deny that. Uh, but it's also not a sustainable uh, status quo uh, because when you have raw violence as the, uh, the currency of the state uh, and then you have one of the largest youth bulges in the world, uh, then something has to be addressed. Uh, and if it's not, a, then the problem only festers. 
the other uh, matter when we talk about the mobilization or we talk about uh, activism, you know, we're talking about uh, youth, youth values uh, who are globalized, who are part of uh, transnational narratives, who do want, who do have local grievances, of course, such as employment um, and, and, and uh, wanting to get married and all that. But overall, they're seeing also themselves as part of a, a transnational sphere where they're sh sharing similar problems uh, across the region. And finally, I'll, I'll probably add that uh, Asif Bayat's uh, concept of the middle-class poor, where and this is really the most dominant category uh, in the sense that middle-class poor means that uh, you have an individual that has a university education, uh, they have aspirations um, to get married, to travel the world, but their finance, their income and mobility does not allow that. So they have the credentials to be a globalized person, but they don't have the, the means to achieve that. And this most, um, you can say, unstable social category tends to be the most revolutionary. And it is the most growing category as well. Thank you. Thanks so much. Alfonso, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Uh, I don't know, I would add, um... Something in the line uh, for, for what I feel Yusuf was was saying. It's that we have maybe a, a bit more negative than than, than than what he was saying. It's that you have to look at it from the uh, you have to look at the mobilizations and the the state of the mobilizations ten years later, not from the from the eyes of the of the activists, but from the eyes of the state actually. And, and what part of the of the problem that I see is that. Uh, well, I was thinking a uh, marginalization, political repression, corruption, the lack of trust in institutions. All of these problems were rooted in the in the Arab uprisings. They were rooted in 2011, and they continue to be part of the problem today. Uh, that that means that we haven't seen really a, a big difference, a change of positions by by the different governments, by the different states, depending on the country situation, might be even. Been worse, and in that sense, I I, I don't feel that the, the situation has has changed that that much in the sense of this of these social tensions that might might continue to to, to arise. And I think that we need to to add or, or I mean we've we've seen so you now in the in the continuation or the persistence of many of these of these protests throughout these these ten years, a, a bit from. Uh, under this this term or this this notion of peripheral protests, the more national protests, uh, Tunisia, Libya, Algeria, all of them have continued to experience the same the same grievances at the end. And I think that uh, the, for for the future, the the problem that we have to see for a, a short term future at the end it's the impact that COVID is going to have and COVID is going to have on the on the state. And I think that we're finding now uh, today this this sort of dilemma between the, the state, what's what's going to happen? Because it seems clear that the, the state is going to play a greater role uh, today, but in, in the provision of, of services, because it, it's part of what the, this health crisis has, has uh, uh, obliged or mandated these, these uh, countries to, or these states to. But I think in that sense, we have to, to take into account if they, like if this greater state, it's, it's going to bring a higher level of authoritarianism and in that sense, it's going to be a greater state at the expense of uh, democratic values, or if it's going to bring a, a, a greater uh, development of welfare states, which might um, bring a solution for the, uh, for, for the population. At any point, I, I don't know, I'm not... Uh, I'm not very confident with the with the situation in that sense. I'm not very confident uh, also with this uh, with this higher level of, of mobilization. I mean, uh, mobilizations have survived, but we've also seen a greater levels of repression pretty much throughout the whole of the of the region or, or the, the countries that we are that we are analyzing. So, if I if I should make some some evaluation, I would say that. Uh, both that we have to look at it through, through the age of the state and that the state actually is posing the, posing the problem as it continues to, to pose many of these obstacles for, for this social economic development. Okay, I think that when we speak about the state and that, that we make that distinction in the report, it is very important to, to distinguish, even though at the end of the day, they both represent obstacles to, 
to change uh, and to any kind of evolution uh, to, to equality or to redistribution, the, the, the political and the economic elites, and how we've seen that, that both of them are quite, uh, uh, <laughs> are quite resistant when it comes to changes. And even in, in, in Tunisia, maybe Yusef can cast a little bit of light, uh, of light on that how even though the political uh, arena has, has evolved and has been involved in a democratic transition to democracy, and nobody can deny that, the economic, uh, the economic arena is, 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 is an evidence that we need to, to tackle two important points. First, governance, of course, because democracy doesn't uh, uh, directly, automatically mean uh, good governance. And also economic evolution or our redistribution and economic justice or social justice that the, the social justice most of the people that took to the streets in 2010, 2011 and have been taken to the streets after that uh, were asking for, right? So I, I think you in your piece you also speak about that. And I also wanted to ask you, and you can of course uh, not answer the question, but because I said that it is might be too big to, build, to, to fail. And Jordan has also that mantra that nobody wants Jordan to collapse. So the, all of the international actors are willing to save Jordan from collapse. It seems that nobody is willing to save Lebanon from collapse because it has, it is already collapsing. But the, what about Tunisia? Because Tunisia has been uh, presented as uh, the, the only success story of, of the Arab uprisings of the so-called Arab Spring. And most international actors were quite involved or having, at least when it comes to theory and when it comes to paper and when it comes to communicate and programs and all of that, quite involved in the transition in Tunisia. But uh, are they as involved as to prevent any kind of collapse that, as you said, might, uh, might be approaching or might be an eventuality when it comes to Tunisia? I think, um, luckily for Tunisia, uh, the fact it, it is very close to Europe and very close to uh, the sources of um, gas that goes to Europe. Um, so, so therefore, for the Europeans, I think um, they cannot afford having a failed state in Tunisia, and uh, therefore, I think there will be always. Um, aid flocking to the country. Um, one, to avoid massive migration. Um, I mean, remember the distance between Tunisia and Italy is uh, it's like it's, it's a flight of half an hour actually and uh, um, by boat some some actually go by um, very small boats, uh, not, not swimming but very small boats to Italy. Um, and um, the uh, one of the main, main pipelines that takes um, gas from Algeria to Europe goes through Tunisia. So uh, that's, um, that makes it uh, quite important. Also, Tunisia uh, is um, between Algeria and Libya, um, and um, therefore it's a very important security partner to the uh, Europeans and the Americans um, in, in this part of the world. Now, this is with relation, this is in regards to avoiding um, that Tunisia as a state collapses. Now, when it comes to Tunisia as a democratic state, um, you're right, it's, it's always, always uh, mentioned as the example, the, uh, uh, the model, and so on and so on. But I don't think. Um, Actually, I don't think the Europeans and the Americans can do more than uh, what they're doing now, because putting a lot of pressure on Tunisia, if, if it reverts from its democratic uh, path, putting lots of pressure will backfire, will backfire because um, nationalism is actually uh, something to be taken into consideration in, in Tunisia, uh, and uh, it will be considered as foreign interference, and that's something that is very, um, that really exists in, in, in the country. Um, you find it in other places in, in the region, uh, but you find it in some places more than in other places. So actually what you could do as international community in Lebanon, you cannot do it in, uh, in Tunisia when speaking 
to uh, to Tunisian politicians um, and when uh, when saying things about Tunisian uh, leaders. So when we see, uh, for instance, Macron and others saying that the Lebanese uh, leaders failed their population or failed their electorate, I don't see them saying that in in Tunisia and um, um, and and not facing any uh, any backlash. So the international community will be there to save Tunisia from economic collapse. Um, but with regards to democracy, they will try to put pressure, but they won't go much uh, much further than uh, where they are today. Okay, thanks so much. So when writing the report, it was impossible for us not to mention human mobility, but instead of speaking about migratory flows in the Mediterranean, which is <laughs> the obsession of, of many reports, uh, I would like to address the role and creation of diaspora. And I don't even know whether the, the concept of diaspora is, uh, is precise enough in order to, 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 to describe but, uh, this, this phenomena. Uh, but the document also mentions that an AMRO that has become that has become one of your fields of expertise, correct me if I'm wrong. But would you like to jump in because you live and you're part of one of the biggest diasporas or groups of people in exile uh, in Europe, of Arab people in exile in Europe and in the global north? Uh, thank you, Chasu. I'm, I don't know if I'm part of an exile group, but I, I, I do live in Berlin and I do interact with uh, exile spaces. Uh, you're right, I, I don't even know if we can call this diaspora. I think diaspora, we tend to have a different connotation with it, you know, like more established, conservative, uh, uh, regressive type of communities. Uh, but in any case, what we do find uh, that's happened in, in, in many Western capitals, um, uh, you know, like Berlin, obviously, but also Paris and Madrid, London, uh, is that there's been a, a different wave of migration from the Arab world uh, and, and refugees that have come who didn't come for necessarily for economic reasons like that would have happened before 2011. And so we're seeing a phenomenon where just like New York was for the Jews after the 1930s who were fleeing Europe uh, and Paris was for Latin Americans who were fleeing the dictatorships in the 70s and 80s, we're seeing a similar phenomenon after 2011 happening with uh, political exiles and creatives and artists and film directors and poets. And you can mention a whole uh, smorgasbord of uh, uh, talents who have you know, come to Berlin. And, uh, and, and just, this is why it's a problem to choose events to go to in Berlin. You just know how many um, exiles are from the Arab world or you know, students or uh, civil society workers and cultural workers are uh, here just given the, the amounts of choices that you're given. And so it makes it difficult to attend any event sometimes because you just give up uh, from the choices that you get. Uh, so it's, it's really, I think I, I would say, a, a, a question that we need to think about in the bigger picture, that what can, can come out of these spaces, given that these are very highly charged up spaces. And I don't just mean Berlin, I mean Madrid and uh, Barcelona are experiencing similar phenomenon with these uh, spaces as well. Uh, will it be a philosophy that could come out, a school of thought, uh, an ideation movement? Uh, I think that's that's an idea that we need to uh, think about. Uh, you know, the the, the unfolding of uh, politics and visionary practices that will engage with the Arab world, if not now, in the future. That's beautiful, and I completely agree on that. I don't. I'm not sure about Madrid, but because I spend lots of time in Paris, that's for sure. When it comes when it comes to Paris, and also when it comes to to London. So all the dynamics are uh, that that we focus, that we put an emphasis on, and that we identify in the report are these evident counter-revolutionary waves and conflicts. And Alfonso, you are turning into quite an expert in Libya. So do you believe that the country has become a case study for this relationship between the, this counter revolution and wave and conflict? And if you <laughs> if you there, in which other countries can you can we observe that? Yeah, well, thank you for your kind words on, on my expertise. Um, I, well, I, I I really think that that Libya is a very good example of 
of what we're seeing uh, of, of this uh, this sort of interweaving between uh, counter-revolutionary uh, trends and, and conflict. I think it's, it's a very good example because Libya has become this sort of multi-leveled uh, conflict that shows uh, local interests or local conflict shows uh, national conflicts and it shows regional or international conflict as well. And it's important to take into account because in this international conflict or these international interests are a mix, of course, of uh, economic interests, of security interests, but at the same time of the of these national agendas, they are at the end a reflection of, of national agendas, and that's where uh, these sort of uh, counter-revolutionary trends uh, come into come into play. And they come into play in, in a sense that I feel that they reproduce many of the tensions that had a, that we've witnessed since since the Arab uprisings, this sort of counter-revolutionary counter uh, wave led by, uh, by Egypt, for instance, or by the, the um, uh, United Emirates States. And this uh, more sort of pluralistic view linked to Islamism, which is, which is for instance, Qatar. And, and, and it's important, it's important for the effect that they've had for the polarization of or that they've created for the legitimization of many of the different actors that were uh, participating in the Libyan war and that have profited and, and, and from from this uh, from this international support and have gained in that sense uh, either momentum or resources that they would not have had if it were not for these for these different uh, foreign countries. And I was thinking in that sense, for instance, say about the the current situation of Libya today. In this sort of a, a, a attempt at unifying a, a government and, and trying to uh, well, to reach the, these these elections that they've been seeking since uh, for, for almost uh, five years already, and I think that we have a, a better situation in Libya today than we had a couple of years ago, for example. But we continue to have some of these same problems, and that's also important. We have some of the same problems, and some of them are, are national. Uh, the, the difficulty to maintain the control uh, of the over the territory by the by the government without uh, relying on the on the militias, or the disagreement around the the political institutions and the the legitimate political institutions. That part of this of this problem that's what interests us. It's linked with the the continued existence of alliances with this foreign uh, with this foreign country. They continue uh, or constant will of these foreign countries to push their agenda, which at the end are, uh, is affecting the, the, the national uh, political agenda of, of the Libyan government. Or, for instance, the the, the existence of, of, of different armies or mercenaries, uh, foreign mercenaries, uh, who continue to act uh, with Libyan who are very difficult to take care of, and that that's one of the problems. When they once they try to pacify the the country, if they ever try to to do so from a from a Libyan national perspective, what are the different mercenaries that refuse uh, that, that refuse to to leave? And uh, responding or linking it to your to your second, question, I think that there are some aspects that we need to highlight in this analysis of the of the situation of Libya uh, um, from an international or taking into account this international international context, we say, and that's the, the weaker presence of the of the United States and the vacuum that it has left, the weaker the, the weaker presence or the inability of the United Nations to impose a to impose a plan, the inability of the European Union to impose a plan or to have a cohesive a, a plan towards uh, towards Libya, and I think all that is important because it sort of uh, reproduces in many of the other conflicts that we can find within the region. It reproduces in Syria, it reproduces in Yemen. Uh, I think it's sort of reproduced uh, in, the, in the support that the different monarchies showed each other uh, after the, the Arab uprisings. And at the end, it's leading, it's leading to, a, a, to more uh, assertive policies pretty much all of the different countries of the region. And, and that might lead at the same time to, to to new conflicts or to different type of, of conflicts. So it's it's not only this counter-revolutionary wave, it's it's also the, the international context in which it which this is developing. That, that's really interesting. So Andrew, I don't know if, we ha if you saw that, but we have a question and I wanted to ask you uh, to ask that question from the audience before 
jump in uh, to, to the last question because I promise this is going to be a short <laughs> a short webinar and we are uh, already at an hour. So Ambro, I don't know if you saw it, they say an interesting point by Ambro about young people with studies and aspirations, your family and pleasures like traveling, being the social group that has most revolutionary potential. Is this true across the region? Of course, the other two can jump in. Okay, thank you, Chacho, and thank you uh, for the question. I would say it's definitely uh, uh, very prevalent across the region. I mean, the concept was not limited to one country, but uh, of an emerging social phenomenon in sociology studies and Middle East studies where we're seeing, you know, this, this sort of new citizen, new resident that uh, in, in Arab countries uh, and in Iran and other places where they have, you know, the, the skill set, they have the the ability to travel, uh, but they don't have the financial means to travel, to buy an apartment, to get married, um, and everything that you'd expect with uh, middle class aspirations are not um, are being curtailed, and they're being curtailed because uh, the state is unable to deliver. Uh, employment is replaced by underemployment, uh, and so uh, and other and other aspects which I'll talk about uh, perhaps uh, later if you want to discuss about the idea of passport mobility. Uh, and so, you know, the issue is that you have a world that talks of globalization, but it's a it's a one way street. And it's and and so and 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 many people in the global south are, are victims to this, where not just in the sense of the middle class poor, but uh, even when they achieve many of the criteria of 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 passing by the passing the. Or, or, should, or should I say satisfying the middle class criteria, they're stopped at the border or at passport control, or there is no, uh, there's always a, a, a limit for them that they hit, or they're victims to the economic fluctuations of, of their country. Uh, so this, I can only see this category continually growing, unfortunately. Thanks so much. Uh, I, I, yesterday I was I was moderating a webinar about uh, it was about Palestine and we had a speaker from Gaza and it's the most thing case because she speaks perfect English, she has education, she's brilliant, and she told us that she wants to travel. Her dream is to, on on the top of her bucket list. Bucket list is to see a lion in a zoo. And she told us about all of these aspirations. And at the end of the day, she said that I have to leave all of my aspirations at the border, be it with Israel or be it with Egypt, because I cannot cross it. And I know that uh, even if my dream is to travel and cross that border and maybe not, not being able to come back to, to Gaza, that's it. And again, even if the concept of middle class in Gaza is it's a little bit more, it may be a conceptual stretching, but I think that that's also a fine. But I, as I said, even if we that, even if the platform mobility is also really important when we think about this conditional citizenship or conditional middle class, we also see that in in other countries in the in the global north. Even if it's not exactly this, not being able to to have sufficient or enough dignity and social justice because the system we belong to is not going to grant you all of these promises, it's not going to fulfill all, those, all of these promises of globalization. And we, we know which are of those promises, it's employment, it's being, it's, uh, it's vertical mobility, and this is becoming harder and harder, yeah. of course, in the global north, but even more so in the global south, because inequality is becoming the key, and it's, it's deepening yeah. and deepening. I don't know well, if you... I mean, the the Chacho, you, you do make very important points and good points. I would just have to say, though, yes, there are similar problems in terms of the way the economy is, 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 is affecting the lives across borders and mutant capitalism that knows no mercy um, in, in the way it operates. But also there are little differences that do make a big, a big changes. So, for example, it's not unusual in Europe to come across uh, couples who uh, do not mind renting, you know, that this is, this is okay as a form of their married life or the life they, they, they will be together that they will rent. Uh, but uh, in, in the Middle East and North Africa, you know, there is almost like a, a, a stated or unstated condition that you have to own an apartment um, and uh, you know, in a house somewhere and to, to be able to get married. To, to use the idea of let's rent uh, would be problematic. 
Uh, so uh, traditional norms in, in, in the region, in the Middle East and North Africa, has, have not caught up with uh, economic changes and, and, the, and, the, and the change that actually keeps, in fact, delays marriage uh, as a result because there are no realistic expectations set. But also even when there are realistic expectations, the other problem is uh, employment or uh, trying to find some sort of meaningful stability before uh, someone ties the knot. Thanks so much, yeah, yeah. Thanks for clarifying that. And that's that's really important. The, the idea that one of one aspiration, one dream, one is to get married because that, that's the start of, of, of the of adult life, I would say, for, for most of us or for, for, for lots of people also in the Middle East and North of Africa. And this is not possible. And you see people with 35 that are maybe in love but cannot cannot uh, give that uh, make that step. So uh, I don't know if Alfonso and Joseph want to contribute to that or uh, so okay. So I'll, uh, I'll I'll go to the last question to the closing question. Uh, thanks so much to the for to the audience for all of you all of you to be here. So and it's a question addressed to the three of you if you want to answer if you are kind enough to answer. And it's what what is your vision of a shared Mediterranean? And Ambro already mentioned the idea of a Mediterranean identity, looking looking forward, not just looking backward. Uh, and and I also have to say a shared Mediterranean, if at all, because there are people that do not believe in this shared Mediterranean and believe that the Mediterranean is a color line, and it's, it's such a there's such an important inequality that we cannot speak of a shared state. But if there's, if you have an idea of a shared Mediterranean, what role should the European Union and its member states and or its member states play in order uh, to have to shape a more sustainable, I gave this concept, sustainable common space? Um, Joseph, do you want to start? Yeah, um, I mean, the idea of a shared Mediterranean is, uh, I mean, uh, that's, that's perhaps the goal of all of us or the hope of all of us. But we need to take into consideration uh, some realities on the ground. One, that we're talking, if, we, if we're talking about a shared Mediterranean between peoples, yes, but peoples are not by themselves. Peoples have governments with them. And in the governments of the Mediterranean, you have, of course, some democracies that mm -hmm. are respectful mm -hmm. of human rights and, um, and of civil society and freedoms. Mm -hmm. um, and these democracies, they can work together because their population can actually work together without a lot of sensitivities. However, you have some very authoritarian states, you have some very colonial states, um, you have some ideological, a lot of ideological divides. And so, that concept or that idea of a shared Mediterranean will be uh, will face issues on on the ground uh, in in in, um, in the real world. Uh, but there are things that can uh, that we can start or that we can continue doing, like um, speaking about um, what we see a lot of exchanges between uh, young people, a lot of um, education scholarships. Uh, education exchanges uh, that can actually lead the way for um, uh, for uh, pave the way for a future that is shared between those who are today uh, young students, um, so that when they are um, older, when they are um, in in positions of power, um, they can push towards more. Uh, of this shared Mediterranean idea. Also, uh, with regards to climate change, which is, as you, as the, as the report uh, rightly say, that the most important uh, problem that we're facing in the upcoming uh, years or decades, um, that's something that um, uh, maybe um, climate scientists from the Mediterranean can uh, work on together um, from now on. But again, I mean, the, the idea of, of a shared Mediterranean is great, but the reality is that these uh, governments that exist are um, not helping. Thanks, <laughs> I was speaking, and, but I was muted. So Alfonso, do you want to jump in and afterwards, Andrew, the floor will be yours? Uh, yes. I. I have to say that I agree with uh, with Yusuf. I, I also have 
want to say that I, I really like this idea that Ambro was highlighting of the same Mediterranean identity in order to face the different uh, risks and the different threats. I would like to think that the shared Mediterranean is something sort of uh, unavoidable, inevitable. And, and I think that on the one on, on one hand, we're moving towards it in the sense that we're uh, seeing a, a greater and greater interdependent Mediterranean and a, a greater levels of interdependence between all the different countries. We're talking about climate change, but we can think of the uh, energy situation. We can think of the, the population, tourism, the diaspora. Uh, the, the economic links, of course, established between the different, the different, um, the different countries. But at the end, uh, that that would be like this sort of bright side. We should look also to the to the negative side, uh, the, the sort of a uh, huge gap that that Yusuf is is commenting, which uh, regards uh, the, the political systems that we have, but also regards, and I think it's very important, the huge economic gap existing the north and the south and the ways that we should uh, uh, sort of try to uh, diminish this diminish this gap and i would like to add um, to, to add this idea to, to to this question that you were asking about what should the, the european union uh, which role should it uh, should it play and i feel i i, I think that the, on the one hand the european union i think should have a, a more co cohesive uh, foreign policy I think that's one of the biggest problems that the European the European Union has uh, today. I think I can link this uh, situation and to this conflict in Libya that I was commenting. This uh, this tension uh, between two poles uh, around the Italy and, and France and the different perspectives that they have on the on the role of, of Germany. And in that sense, uh, it really needs to, to to be able to make up for to make or or develop a, a diplomacy and a foreign policy that is common to to all of the different countries. On the uh, on the second hand, I, I also think, and, and, and it's it's sort of linked with, with with something that we've commented, and it's this fear of this uh, foreign intervention, or if it's not from a military perspective, let's say foreign interference, and it, and I think that in that sense, uh, the European Union needs to develop a more sustainable relations with the with the South. A more sustainable in the sense that they bring more profit to the population of the south and they're perceived as more profitable by the by the south and i'm thinking in that sense to, uh, about economic agreements about free trade agreements and i think that the, the an ideal world should be should lead us to to to, to these economic agreements that are perceived as a as a sort of position from the european union to the southern countries but also some some uh, economic agreements that are bringing actually an actual profit to the uh, to the southern southern Mediterranean uh, populations and not only to the political elites elites or the, uh, the economic elites but to the uh, populations as a whole. Thanks so much, Amra. Thank you, Chacho. Uh, I've actually written a, a lot about the whole Mediterranean project and. Uh, transnational citizenship. And I think the one part that really gets missed, miss, missed out on is the fact that uh, we are not at the level of ensuring mobility happens because of visa regimes and passport apartheid. Um, so to give you an example, a, a friend of mine uh, here in, in, uh, in Berlin, she's an Egyptian journalist, very talented. And she said to me when she gets her German passport, because she's applying for citizenship, the first place she's going to go to is Morocco. Now, think how crazy this is, okay? Because uh, she, she's waiting for that to go to Morocco. Now she can, of course, go from Egypt to Morocco, but she might not get that visa. But with a passport, a German European EU passport, she won't be refused. Uh, so it's like the road from Cairo to Tangiers is, or Cairo to Casablanca, uh, has to go through Berlin in some respects. Uh, and so we have been in, in, in situations uh, as an instructor uh, in Berlin or other cities in, in Europe where we cannot get people from the Arab world even when we have uh, the governmental support uh, or the, even the foreign ministry or ministry of higher education of the respective European country. So for example, we were not able to get three Moroccan researchers uh, from uh, from uh, Morocco because the the staff in the German consulates in Rabat 
were sick. All of them just happened to be sick. And so we missed out on the Moroccan voice to come to an Arab world event that was taking place in, uh, in Berlin. And then on another occasion, uh, 10 Egyptian researchers could not make it to Germany because the rules for visa application had changed in, in Cairo at the embassy, meaning we just lost 10 academics just like that. Um, so uh, the, the matter is, is that these, ha these have to be discussed at the high level. And I've seen this discussion happen at the institutional level in Brussels and I've sat at meetings and I've heard you know, recommendations such as a, a talent passport and uh, for, um, for Arab world researchers and all that, but even talent passport is problematic in itself, but that's for another discussion. Uh, but until we allow mobility, uh, many problems will not be resolved. It, it, there's got to be an, a dignified and a, and a way that we can ensure that people can move across borders without the headache of consulates and, 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 and visa delays and, and no visas at all. This is something that really needs to be emphasized and, and, and done to death until it, the message is hammered home. Thank you. That, that is so powerful, uh, Amro, and I couldn't agree more. This, even this idea of the this talent, right? We just so the, the rest of the people who are not talented enough are not allowed to, to come in. That, that's the problem. Uh, and that's why we might not be able to speak about the short nature anyway, or horizontal relations in, in the least. Uh, so thank you all. And I, again, it's one hour and a half, 15 minutes. <laughs> And we are getting better at that. Uh, this is such an honor and such a pleasure. And always, I, I really love speaking with you, even if it's uh, in a cafe or in a webinar. Hopefully, some more cafes and more bars or whatever you want to, 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 to meet, wherever you want to meet. And I'm really grateful that on my behalf, on my behalf of the foundation. And thanks so much to the, to the three of you and to the audience. And to the audience that's going to join afterwards through YouTube because the video is going to be posted and uh, have a, a fantastic afternoon and all my regards and warmest wishes. Thanks so much. Thank you, Otacho. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye, all. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. Masala. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.